Hey guys, my name is Gary Huang. I interviewed 153 seven-figure Amazon sellers and e-commerce experts, and today I wanted to share with you my top seven takeaways. By the way, I'm the host of the Seven Figure Seller Summit. Uh, it's hosted online, and my mission is to really help Amazon and e-commerce sellers build, scale, and exit their businesses. So today I'm gonna break down the top seven things that I learned from them, and as I was speaking to these seven figure sellers and e-commerce experts, I noticed uh, some common threads and traits that seem to come up again and again. That's why I took some time to sit down. I distilled them down to share with you the top seven things that I learned after interviewing seven figure sellers and uh, by the way this is brought to you by the seven figure seller summit we're launching the sixth edition of the award-winning Amazon conference uh, event and we will be launching the sixth edition February 28th through March 4th and you can get a free pass to attend online at sevenfiguresellersummit.com uh, the link is below all right so to kick things off as as we're um, entering 2022, uh, I feel like e it's the wild west of e-commerce. On one hand, you have the golden opportunity. E-commerce is con continuing to boom. Amazon is still growing exponentially. Um, and then uh, there's another huge opportunity in terms of selling your Amazon business, right? Because a few years ago, if you thought about selling an Amazon business, people probably would have thought that you're crazy. But now there's big aggregators um, playing in the field, uh, such as Thrasio and they're paying multiples of five times to even seven times EBITDA earnings be before interest, tax depreciation, and amortization or profitability, basically. So it could be a once in a lifetime opportunity. I feel like it's almost like the property market, like the housing market. It's red hot right now. So this could be a golden year for a lot of you guys um, in the Amazon and e commerce world. But on the other hand, just like in the Wild West, there's a lot of risks involved as well, right? There's all these potential pitfalls. We're still in the middle of the whole perfect storm of supply chain, the high shipping costs, the delays, um, the, the backlog at the ports, and in, in addition to all the inventory restrictions that we're still facing, um, these fees just continue to pile on up. In addition, PPC costs are, are ever growing at an all time high, um, and not to mention competition continues to get bigger and bigger. All right, so it is a very uh, exciting time to be in the Wild West. So this leads us to the first big takeaway that I learned, and it has to deal with mindset. I find as of right now, seven figure sellers, they really have this type of execute or die mindset. What do I mean by that? First off is resiliency, speed. We can't just skate on by anymore, right? When it comes to all these different changes, you need to pivot very quickly, focus on speed. It's almost like in the Wild West, there's like a duel between two cowboys. Whoever can draw off the quickest is the one that's going to come out on top and the other one's going to get blown away, right? So if you're too slow to react, you're going to get blown away. I mean, you're not going to out Thrasio Thrasio, right? So um, you see this, especially right now with launch strategies. Amazon recently had a terms of service change. The, um, rebates are no longer allowed. Search, find, buy, review manipulation. They're really cracking down on this in the past uh, few months. A lot of sellers are getting um, warnings from Amazon, if not getting suspended outright. So if you're doing the same launch strategy that you did in 2021, right now you could risk getting suspended. So seven-figure sellers are using alter alternate launch strategies, right? They're very resilient. They have to execute a new strategy. So um, seven-figure sellers like Chris Rawlings completely updated his 2022 launch strategy. He's really focusing on a PPC launch method. And other sellers like Sharon Evan, a seven-figure seller, also is incorporating new tactics, tactics including using PPC I mean, with buying intent in mind. So these sellers are really pivoting. They're really resilient. Um, the mindset is you, you can't just skate on buy anymore. You really have to pivot quickly to succeed. All right. So that's the first point. This leads us to the second point. And this is one thing that really surprised me. And then the fact is these successful seven-figure sellers, they're just focusing on one to two things and outsourcing all the rest right so this actually surprises me because traditionally there's that saying you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket right I mean diversification to uh, diversify your risk right but as of 2022 in the wild west of e-commerce you have this huge opportunity but you really have to focus on just one to two things that you can execute and do much more better than your competitors, right? Because if you're diversifying in too many places, doing too many things, you're distracted by all these shiny new objects, you can't really do anything well, right? I mean, it's like that expression, like the dog that tries to um, chase two rabbits ends up catching none, 
right? So a case in point, uh, one of the seven figure sellers I interviewed, his name John Elder. Um, he's based in Dallas, Texas, and he uh, built up his business and recently exited in the mid seven figure range. Um, and then he said that his main mission, his main focus was to research the right products to add to his product line and launch them successfully, right? And he did it the right way. He didn't do any black hat tactics. He wasn't distracted by shiny new objects. He was just really focused on adding those products to grow his business. It took him five years to build up his business and sell it. And three of those years, he was working full time in, um, in a seven to five job in the construction business. All right. So, I mean, he said that, you know, he had to focus and he had to sacrifice. I mean, he sacrificed Netflix. He sacrificed going to the gym. Uh, he's a family man. And he actually had a newborn during those first three years as he was working full time and working on his Amazon business. And he sacrificed his lunch breaks. Uh, he said that everyone else went out. He just sat in front of his computer and started answering questions from his customers on Amazon, right? Um, he, he even had to sacrifice time with his wife. He said, honey, uh, tonight I got to spend one hour uh, talking to my tiny supplier right I mean with the time zone difference so uh, that's what it really takes you know just that focus on the one to two things so that you can really um, you can really do it well and to separate yourself from your competition so I feel that is point number two um, really focus on one to two things and he outsourced the rest so you know he was able to outsource his PPC his uh, Amazon advertising he was able to outsource his bookkeeping right I mean there's a lot of different tools out there and then we'll get into that later as well all right so and the same thing um, we see from the buyer side, right? I mean, you may think that, you know, traditionally buyers like to see some diversification in multiple channels, not necessarily, you know, I spoke with Gwen Sylvester, she's in charge of acquisitions at Thrasio. And then she said that buyers like Thrasio actually prefer to see sellers that really focused on doing one to two things well, because it's very clear that they're, that's their strength. Otherwise they wouldn't have been able to build up a business to that level. At the same time, there could be opportunities where a buyer's weakness could be an opportunity um, I mean, a seller's weakness could be an opportunity for a, a buyer to come in and strategically fill in those gaps, whether it comes to, um, you know, bumping up their PPC or doing supplier negotiations. Um, it actually is attractive to buyers, all right? So, you know, focusing on one to two things and outsourcing the rest, this is the number two thing that I see seven-figure sellers really doing right now, and which leads us to number three. Selling on Amazon right now is a pay-to-play game, especially when it comes to advertising. What do I mean by that? Did you know that Amazon Amazon advertising is the third largest digital advertising business only behind Google ads and Facebook ads. Amazon just announced recently that their ad revenue hit $31 billion in 2021, which is huge. And at the same time, the cost of Amazon CPC is going up. According to Ritu Java, she's the co-founder of PPC Ninja. They're an agency that works with many seven and eight figure Amazon sellers. Their clients on average are spending 23% more year on year, right? The cost of paper per click is going up. And then more importantly, if you look at the search results on any Amazon um, search results page, you can see much of the top of the page's real estate is dominated by sponsored ads, sponsored brands, um, not necessarily the organic search results, right? So what does this mean? It, this means if you're a seller, if you're not advertising, you're not getting in on that prime real estate, then and you're only relying on organic search results, your competitors could take that real estate from you, and then you will be left behind. And then we're seeing that PPC strategies are becoming more and more important from the start of a product launch to growing and scaling a business and even to defend against competitors where um, smart sellers actually bid on their own product pages so that this will prevent competitors from taking that real estate on your product listings page, right? So all in all, Amazon is really expanding and refining their advertising options recently with sponsored products, sponsored brands, DSP and more. Uh, and according to seven figure sellers um, like Chris Rawlings, your, you know, your advertising on Amazon can be used to drive sales, to drive your listings organic ranking, right? So in the, in the past few months, he's seen it's been extremely effective 
effective to use PPC to rank products on Amazon. And effectively, you can drive pur purchases from specific ser search terms to help you not only get sales from those terms, but also to spike the Amazon algorithm to increase the rank organically for those search terms. So it, it's, it's like a flywheel. So the key takeaway is that if you're not advertising or not optimizing your Amazon advertising, then you will be left behind. So if you're doing it effectively, it can help boost your organic rank and then start the Amazon flywheel to lead to more sales and growth. All right. This leads up to number four, um, the takeaway number four, which is to build a moat around your business. What do I mean by that? Many seven figure sellers have said either outright that they're building a moat around their business or alluded to building a defensible wall around their business, right? So this makes it hard for competitors to come in to penetrate their business. So think about a castle, a medieval castle where there was a moat of water surrounding it, right? So this will keep the bad guys and, you know, their horses and um, from being able to just knock down the door, right? So um, there's many ways you can build a moat around your business. And um, these, these ways include first to make your product hard to copy. And one way to do this is with rapid product development and using hacks such as 3D printing to reduce the time period required to develop a product. And it can cut down product development from weeks to days as seven figure seller Chris Davey does with his products. Other ways to uh, include other ways to do this to make it hard to copy is to include personalization, which is what Jordan Lindbergh, a seven figure seller, does with his funeral products, which generate several million dollars of sales revenue per year. And then he offers custom engraving on his products with uh, the, the person's name, uh, the deceased name, which is, um, you know, this type of engraving is very difficult for his competitors to duplicate. And then by doing so, he can also mark up his products by up to 30 percent as well. Right. Think about that. If you can price higher by 30%, imagine the increased profit margins you can achieve, right? Other ways to build a moat around your business include using legal methods such as patents, copyrights, and trademarks. This will protect your intellectual property or IP from unethical competitors, right? So even if you're not a seven figure seller, small solopreneurs can leverage these methods at a low cost. And many times they can even do it themselves, according to John D. Giacomo from Revi Revision Legal. And they're a law firm that specializes in working with small businesses and e-commerce entrepreneurs, right? Um, another way you can build a moat around your business is product licensing. And this is an advanced tactic to build a moat around your business. Paul Miller, a seven-figure seller, told me that the the licensing by licensing a big name like you know George Foreman with the George Foreman grills back in the day Disney's Frozen or even your favorite sports team will not only prevent copycats from selling your product um, unless they want to face a lawsuit but it has, a, has the additional bonus to immediately gain a built-in audience of raving fans to sell more product to all right and then um, another method to build a moat around your product is to build an audience. Vance Lee and his business partner have raised over $1.3 million from using crowdfunding such as Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And then he says that many Amazon sellers have a competitive edge in knowing how to do deep customer research and product development with overseas suppliers. If you were to apply these skills to crowdfunding in your next product launch, you can instantly build an army of backers whose emails that you own. So you can actually build an email list. And this is something that Amazon and especially Jeff Bezos would not approve of, right? So by building this list, you can remarket to them. And then um, if you if you do this well, I mean, this could be something that's even more attractive in terms of your business valuation. If you have that email list of uh, tens of thousands of um, emails, then this could be very valuable to an acquirer uh, if you do decide to exit your business. All right. So I'd like to take a minute to uh, quickly pause and mention that all of these takeaways were from my interviews done at the Seven Figure Seller Summit. So if you haven't already, I highly recommend you guys can grab a free pass uh, at Seven Figure Seller Summit to catch the full length interviews. And remember, these are just my personal takeaways. All right. So this leads us to point number five, scaling your business. All right. You really need to delegate and to automate so you can work on your business, not in your business. All right. So recently when I pulled a group of about 37 figure sellers uh, speaking at the summit, what was their number one mistake? A uh, number of them admitted that it was hiring too late. Okay. 
not outsourcing quicker and trying to be a superwoman, which results in working in your business rather than on your business. Trying to do too much myself is still a problem. Egla Radik is a seven figure seller. She's based in Estonia. She said one of the top mistakes that she made on the way to seven figures was not hiring soon enough. Once she realized this, she started to list down anything that is repetitive uh, three to four times a month that she's doing. And this became a list of tasks for future employees. And then she created standard operating procedures or SOPs and then taught them to her hires. And then she feels that we as entrepreneurs are creators. Okay. We are always bringing more money in. We are hired to bring new money. So we need to buy more time. Okay, that's why we need to hire people to help us. And then I strongly believe in this as well. So not only hiring people, um, sellers are also using tools to automate or delegate parts of their business. This frees up their time. So some examples of uh, great tools include Gatita. Uh, Gatita is a, a software tool that is really good at Amazon reimbursements or getting your money back. According to their founder, Yoni Mazur, most Amazon sellers they work with can get a reimbursement from Amazon on about one to two percent of your annual Amazon revenue. I don't know. I don't know about you, but if I can get back one to two percent added to my bottom line, you know that's fantastic. This is because Amazon often loses your FBA inventory. They may miss make some mistakes when they measure your product size. They may oversize or over measure your products, and then this results in more fees. They overcharge you as a result. So oftentimes, sellers like me, you know, we're so busy trying to grow our business, we don't have time to go through all the numbers and the details to discover these discrepancies. So it does make sense to outsource this so you can get your money back and you can really focus on those one to two things to grow your business. Another example is ping pong payments. They have tools to save you time when paying suppliers internationally, right? And also they tend to send the money even faster than traditional bank wires and they tend to have lower fees. All right. So this also can save you time and money. Other automation tools to save time include data dive. This is a, a new product research and keyword research tool from Brandon Young. And uh, this really helps you with deep keyword research and it used to take hours and hours, days and days. And now you can do it in seconds with just a click of a button. Uh, other tools that I like include SentryKit. SentryKit is a, a tool to help monitor your Amazon listings in case you get suspended. Oftentimes they'll notify, notify you even quicker than Seller Central, right? Um, this has happened to me before in the past with one of my products. For some reason it got reclassified the a kitchen product got reclassified into the adult category and then as a result immediately um we got a notification from century kit and i was able to get it reclassified even before seller central notified me all right um so there's many tools out there to save you time and money all right so uh, this leads us to point number six okay um in terms of profitability okay the costs to run your business are growing every single day right now we are seeing the high shipping costs uh, upwards of twenty thousand dollars for a container to be shipped from china to the u.s um, the increasing ppc cost the raw material cost you name it right so right now to offset these costs Smart sellers really need to focus on profitability and to know your numbers, right? According to Anna Hill, who is an accountant that works with a number of seven and eight figure e-commerce sellers, profitability is everything, right? That's the whole purpose of your business is you want to be profitable to meet your personal financial goals, right? Whether it's to take care of your family, to have financial freedom, to spend um, more time on your passion projects or, you know, make that, um, you know, pay off your house, right? I mean, ultimately, it it boils down to profitability, right? So um, how are seven figure sellers improving their profitability? Uh, I would say number one, it starts with the supply chain, right? You got to renegotiate with your suppliers, you know, in terms of pricing, um, you know, as of right now, after Chinese New Year, it's actually um, Chinese suppliers have their uh, fiscal fiscal calendars based on the, the lunar calendar. So after Chinese New Year, a lot of times, these companies will adjust their pricing and oftentimes they'll raise their prices. So you have to be prepared to renegotiate your pricing. I mean, if if you haven't spoken to your supplier in some time, you know, it may be a good time to see if you can get a better price or if your supplier is trying to raise the price on you, you should have a counter offer. Don't just immediately accept it. 
right? Um, you have to be smart about it. And this, every penny saved will have a, a multiplied effect on your bottom line, right? Through all, all of the tens of thousands of units that you're ordering, all right? So um, other than that, we're seeing sellers, seven-figure sellers like Jamie Parros based in Australia, really optimizing their package sizes, right? Um, Jamie Parros even went so far as to develop his own software tool, um, ship savvy to optimize his carton packaging so that he can maximize the units that he can put in, in a container. So think about it. If previously, if you can only put 1000 units in a container and if you can optimize your carton size to make it smaller, more compact or, or, you know, put it in a way, I mean, think about Tetris, you know, having like the, the, the carton, you know, maximized, let's say you can bump up from 1000 units to 1,300 units. Imagine the cost savings that you can get for every single unit. I mean, if you're paying the same shipping price, right? Um, so all of these are ways to increase your profitability. And then some of the more creative sellers that I've spoken with, such as Ken Wilson and David Schomer, they really thought outside the box, right? Um, in their session at the summit, they really shared their complete roadmap on how they self manufacture in the US. Right. So previously they sourced product from China, but then they found a way to move their their sourcing to the US at even a lower landed cost. Right. So even though everyone knows the labor cost in the States is a lot higher, but they were able to cut their product landed cost because they saved on the tariffs, they saved on duties, uh, they saved on the shipping costs, they saved on the delivery lead times. I mean, instead of four months delivery lead time from China, they cut it down to four days. I mean, they were able to buy out their neighbor's barnyard in the Midwest, and then they uh, turned it into a small factory, right? And then they were able to cut down on all of these expenses and make, and still, you know, creative ways to be more profitable right um, just to dive a little bit deeper because I feel profitability is so important um, you really have to know your numbers right and then one of the things that a lot of sellers are overlooking is that you have to fire the non-performing products what do I mean by that I know a lot of sellers and me included you know our products are like our children our babies you know we, we blood sweat and tears to launch it to groom it to raise it up but sometimes you know you, we have to separate ourselves this is a business right you have to fire the non-performers so I wanted to share with you a key metric called post advertising gross margin. What is this? This is your gross margin and then you subtract all of your Amazon advertising fees and your non Amazon like your uh, Facebook ads, Google ads fees to get your post advertising gross. Um, a couple of benchmarks that I, I, I learned from Tyler Jeffcoat known as the seller's accountant. Um, in terms of post advertising gross, the best products he's seen are getting 35% post advertising gross. If you're getting 25%, that's good that's healthy 20 percent is a yellow flag it's time to rehabilitate these products look at ways that you can uh, cut expenses or improve your your margin there and then if you're 15 percent or below that's in the red guys you got to fire that product all right so um, you have to really know your numbers and fire the non-performers all right so this leads us to our last but not least point number seven all right exits selling your business successful seven figure sellers that have exited they begin with the end in mind they build a roadmap to uh, value to valuation of their amazon businesses while they're hot so again as we mentioned earlier we're seeing really high multiples as of right now in the 5x to even 7x range i mean just a few years ago 2x to 3x multiple of um sde was considered good now we're seeing you know companies like Thrasio are paying up to 7x, right? But at the same time, it's not so easy to get that, right? You really have to build a roadmap to your valuation. So Paul Miller, um, who's a seven-figure seller and also host of Amazing Exits podcast, shared that, for example, if you want a goal, uh, a net of $1 million in your bank account at the end of the day after taxes, and if you want to do it in a certain time period, you really have to map it out. Let's right? say you want a um, goal net $1 million, uh, in 12 months, right? You have to break it down to the nuts and bolts, right? You need to figure out how many products do you need to launch in the next 12 months, right? And then you also have to consider the amount of capital that you need, your cash flow. Do you need to take out more loans, lending options, right? Um, other 
eight figure sellers such as Josh Dietrich, who's exited his business share that um, from the buying side, you have to consider what the buyer wants, right? They normally want to see a strong, healthy business with at least two years history, right? Not something that just um, that just started just a few months ago. And then buyers want to see seller discretionary earnings of um, ideally a million dollars or, or more. Uh, but at the same time, we have to look at the, the other side of the coin. There's some red flags that buyers will avoid and definitely you don't want to do this. So Josh Dietrich also shared um, buyers are are turned off by margin erosion. If your pro product margins are going down or declining month to month revenue, right? Buyers want to see continued growth. They don't want to see stagnation. So during the process, a lot of times um, negotiation and preparing for an exit can be like running another business. So um, sell smart sellers will put that extra time, but at the same time, they they don't let their foot off the gas with their main business. They have to continue to add products and to grow that business. All right. Um, another red flag to avoid is too much complexity. Josh Dietrich did some of the kidding in house, meaning uh, for some of his FBM or fulfilled by merchant um, multi packs, let's say like a three pack product. They actually he actually kitted this in house, right? That's not scalable in the eyes of a buyer, right? So that's too much complexity like that buyers will avoid. All right. So um, um, if you are considering an exit, I just wanted to add one more bonus tip for you guys. There's one thing that a lot of sellers overlook and that's ad backs. All right. So what is this? This could be your owner's, you know, your salary as an owner, credit card points or software tools, right? By adding this back to your seller discretionary earnings, according to Joe Valley um, from Cry Out Light Brokerage, you can earn a, a multiple on every dollar you save. Right. So if you you can get a five X or seven X multiple, if you're able to add back uh, $10,000, then that could be up to $70,000 on the valuation. And meanwhile, I highly recommend that you check out Joe Valley's book, The Exitpreneur's Playbook. He has a whole chapter where he lists over a dozen different ad backs that you can add back. All right. So there these are the top seven tips um, that I've learned after interviewing over 153 seven figure and e-commerce sellers. But um, these are these are are just my personal takeaways and i feel like it's the tip of the iceberg because we are launching the next seven figure seller summit six february 28th and march 4th 2022 we're expecting over 30 speakers and it's like the wild west in e-commerce and we're really um inviting these sellers to show you what they're doing to survive and thrive in 2022 so i highly recommend you grab your free pass if you haven't already uh, you can get it at the link below the video seven figure seller summit.com all right Thanks so much, guys. Have a great year ahead, and we will see you at the next session. Bye, everyone.